All right. Should we get started? Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kristen Kang. I'm the manager of the Hassander program. And it's my pleasure to be visiting Gardner Country today in the wonderful Samory building here in Adelaide. Uh, we have a few dozen people attending here in person and a few hundred attending online. We're here today to showcase the achievements of the Hassander program and to launch a key output of the program, the Health Data Australia platform, a new online portal to help share data for health research. <laughs> Myself and Adrian Burton from ARDC will take you through that shortly uh, and will be followed by three members of our Hassander network. But to formally kick things off today, I'd like to hand over to Professor Steve Wessling. Steve has been the Executive Director at SAMRI for over a decade, and his former roles include the Chair of the NHMRC Research Council, the Director of the NHMRC Council, uh, and the President of the Australian Academy uh, of Health and Medical Sciences. So, Steve, thank you for hosting us today here at SAMRI and for getting us started. Professor Steve Wessling. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for inviting me to do this. And on behalf of SAMRI, welcome. We love to have people in our building. We love to show off our building. We love to show off SAMRI. Um, but today we're showing off a sander and, and that's very exciting for us. So I'd like to welcome everyone in the room and also everyone online. And importantly, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Ghana land. I'd like to acknowledge elders past and present. I'd like to acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders in the room today. And as I often do, I'd like to acknowledge the magnificent work that our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in Samri do. So we have about 30 Indigenous researchers based in this building at the Women's and Children's, at Flinders and across the state, and they just do amazing work. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that. So, um, as the executive director of SAMRI, and actually I'm about, this is, I'm sort of eight days, I think, away from finishing as executive director of SAMRI and moving on to a new job, and that is the CEO of NHMRC. So this is doubly interesting to me, um, because not only has this been a fabulous outcome in South Australia and, uh, and Australia-wide, but it's something that's of great interest to me from the data point of view, and SAMRI's always been very interested in data, but also from the NHMRC point of view about how we can um, help in this area in the, in the time ahead, and particularly thinking about data, thinking about guidelines, thinking about registries, all those sorts of things. So in South Australia, Health Translation SA um, led the collaboration of partners in South Australia to develop the Hassander node. And, uh, and SAMRI, uh, amongst all the partners in this launch, have been very active in this developmental stage. The node here is one of nine Hassander nodes spread across Australia. And uh, I think it's fabulous to see such a truly collaborative and national research network. And um, one I'm sure can be modeled for other aspects. Because I think we all recognize that through research and research funding, and most research funding we have to accept is public money. Um, and through that funding, we create a lot of data and more often than not, in fact, I think sort of 99% of the time, none of that data is reused. And so this development here to look at that data and look at how that data can be reused is, is really very exciting. And I think most Australians would expect that if we develop that data utilising their money and often their time, if that happens to be a clinical trial or those sorts of things, that that data would then be available to others to ensure those assets are widely used to improve health of Australians. So this uh, Hassander asset, the Health Studies Australian National Data Asset, um, led by the Australian Research Data Commons, should really be congratulated on developing the infrastructure which enables discoverability, accessibility and reuse of health research data and, and such an important outcome Yet, I think all you guys would realise how difficult that's been. It's really been a, a, a huge challenge, um, but it's one that I think um, has been done remarkably well. So the Health Data uh, Australian platform has been co-designed with the Australian research community 
and it provides primary researchers and data custodians with a mechanism not available before, as I mentioned, whereby we can meet their public funding obligations to share the outputs of research. And therefore, other researchers seeking data to really develop their own ideas can go to this platform and it provides a central, seamless, streamlined national resource for achieving that. And uh, I think if we think about it over the next few years, this is going to be incredibly exciting. Uh, and we're, we're looking at clinical data at the moment, but in the future, just imagine if we could share all of the data assets that we have, um, whether that includes registries or the amazing data that other agencies within the federal department have and so on. And I think that's going to be very exciting for the Australian research community. So I, um, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Hisanda program, to congratulate the Australian health researchers who have been involved, congratulate all the people in this room and online who have been involved. And I'm really looking forward to see how this platform gets utilised, how important it becomes in research in Australia. And I've got written here that I now have to say the, the Health Data Australian platform is now officially launched. So thank you very much. And I'm sure that we're going to hear uh, more detail and more complete understanding than I have just given you from the speakers following me. Um, but um, I have to introduce Adrian Burton. And um, Dr. Adrian Burton has had 20 years experience in applying emerging information technology to research at a national and international level with backgrounds in IT, academia, government and linguistics. He addresses opportunities holistically, ensuring that policy, people and governance frameworks work alongside systems, services and infrastructure. So thanks, Adrian, and Adrian will be the next speaker. Thank you, Steve. The ARDC is part of a national scheme, NCRIS, the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure. There are 24 national programs in that scheme. It's a very innovative policy approach that acknowledges that not every, you can't address everything when resources are split into um, research projects or research institutions or even state-based initiatives. Some problems uh, need special resourcing to be addressed at uh, a national scale. And that's what NCRIS uh, sets out to do. So in that spirit, in 2019, and thank you, Hugo and uh, David, the, uh, with the CSIRO, uh, ARDC set out to do consultation with the health and health translation community. And it was identified that at a national scale, there is a, an amazing potential for the secondary use of health studies data for, you know, to support health translation. So uh, I have some slides that I could... Um, show you here that's the NCRIS partners so the Hassanada initiative was then uh, born and it is um, managed or uh, guided by a steering committee that includes ACTAR, uh, ANZ CTR, NHMRC, CHF, Research Australia, ARA, Cochrane and PHRN um, helping to guide it uh, in to make sure that it responds to research requirements. Uh, the initial focus in the, the program that, we've, that we're just establishing now is clinical trials data. So in the middle of all of that for 2019, guess what happened in the middle? There was a little pandemic uh, that slightly you know, shook our resourcing and focus on this establishment project, but it did serve to underline how important it is to get high quality data from good health studies, uh, access them from multiple sources, bring them together. Uh, people like Julian then synthesizing it, 
uh, changing a guideline and then improving outcomes for both health and uh, the whole economy. So that really is the, uh, although we weren't ready to deliver, we we're right in the middle of our development program, it's really underpinned the importance of this kind of activity. So uh, what kind of infrastructure is required for um, supporting secondary use of data? The ARDC brings a very holistic approach to data. If you go from right, right to left uh, in that slide, we're doing storage and compute, the high technology stuff, data and services, the really content and informatics, uh, platforms and software for access and analytics, and then people and policy. We bring to the table all of that in a big package, a holistic package for um, research infrastructure. Uh, Kristen will be um, sort of walking us through some of the uh, technology sides and the systems and procedures that we've established, but it is really important to highlight that last block, people and policy, as, an, as a national network, Cassandra has been able to address questions of uh, data governance, uh, ethics and consent, and the whole culture of data sharing and uh, value for society. And we've been able to do that at a national scale. And it's an absolutely integral part of infrastructure. Uh, that work continues and we hope over the next uh, uh, months and years to work with research institutions, uh, academic societies, uh, publishers and funders uh, to create a coherent policy environment for the infrastructure for data sharing. Um, what else have I got to say? Uh, let's have a look at another slide. Right, so this is the launch of a nationally um, coordinated infrastructure to support secondary uh, data started in 2019. Unfortunately, I've got bad, good news and bad news for the participants. It's not the finish line. <laughs> it's the starting line. Uh, in fact, this is where we start you know, to have an infrastructure that can actually support uh, the secondary use of data. That data can have its uh, outcomes and impacts for society. Um, so, uh, ARDC, uh, luckily, the NCRIS program is a multi-decadal program that uh, has funding for uh, fundamental infrastructure for leading edge research, and uh, we hope to push that out. What we'll be doing is the same challenges um, that we brought to the table for this community, data discovery, secure environments, integration, analytics, We'll be pushing it out to some further uh, stakeholders uh, as well um, and looking for the same kind of holistic uh, approaches. Um, so what does this mean for our Hassanda um, colleagues? It means that we have the opportunity uh, over the next five years to really bed down what we started here with clinical trials and make it work and make it deliver the outcomes that we set out. So we're right at the, we've done our activity, we've delivered an output, it needs to generate uh, support research and have, start to have those outcomes. And we are here for the next five years to work with you uh, to deliver that. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to think about um, how we will mobilize that kind of health studies data uh, for using you know, other technologies and analytics, et cetera, how we will mobilize it uh, to really make a difference in health translation. We look forward to working with you for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adrian. So I'm now going to take you all through the platform that we've built and how it works. Uh, a quick note that we thought we were on Zoom with a few hundred people rather than risk a Zoom mishap. We're not going to be showing you the live site and trying to switch screens there. So we've got a series of screenshots to show you of the platform. Not quite the same experience, but uh, the site is now live. So um, please do explore it at your leisure. So. <clears throat> Welcome to Health Data Australia, a central place where health researchers can search for data held around the country and request access to that data. So if I'm a researcher, I start here with a simple keyword search. 
When I perform that search, it takes me to categorize search results. And each listing that we see here is a clinical trials data set. This list is going to grow over time. And we also will begin listing data, as we heard before, from other kinds of health studies, uh, such as cohorts, registries, and so on. As a researcher, if I click into one of these results, uh, I see a description of the data set. If I scroll down, let's just pretend that I scroll down the page there, I see the related funders of the clinical trial, the researchers and organizations involved in that clinical trial, and the publications associated with that trial and with that data set. I scroll a little further and I see a persistent identifier for the data set. This allows us to track that data set's use. We also see information about the trial that produces the data, uh, and this information is pulled down from the ANZ-CTR. That ANZ-CTR information includes the details about the data access conditions uh, and hyperlinked information about the study protocol and data dictionary. So as a secondary researcher, if I'm looking at this, uh, if I see that this data could be of value to my research, perhaps for my systematic review or to help develop my clinical guideline, I log into HDA, I click access, and now I get to fill in a form, a standardized data request form. So I give details about who I am and the team that I'm working with. Details about my project, including the scientific rationale for my project and the design of my research. I give details about what I intend the outputs of my research to be. Will it be a journal article, conference presentation, student thesis, etc.? And importantly, I give the details of my ethics approval and uh, supporting documentation. Then I click submit. So that request is then sent back directly to the primary researcher or their delegated data custodian. As a custodian, I get an email notification about the request. I can then log into my own dashboard in the platform and see the new requests that I've received as well as those in progress and action them. If I click into the details one of those um, from the dashboard, I see the summary information about the request and then all that detailed information that the requester provided me is converted into a PDF for easy viewing, but also for easy distribution to a trial governance committee if required. So as a custodian, as a clinical trialist, I can use the platform to respond to the person making the request. Now, the platform has a flexible workflow for responding to requests, and it allows the custodian to apply their own governance policies, to ask for more information from the requester, uh, and to approve or reject requests as they deem appropriate. So this is a really key point. Health Data Australia doesn't replace or dictate a trial's governance or data access arrangements. It simply uses a common framework for responding to requests and it allows the requester and the custodian to track the progress of all these requests in one place. So I'm going to keep this brief and not technical. Um, I do want to emphasize a key message for trialists who believe in collaboration and want to get the most uh, research value out of their data, but understandably have concerns about some of the implications of data sharing. So for the clinical trialists out there, the outputs of your research and most importantly, your participants data stays within your control. It's not stored in the Health Data Australia platform. Similarly, your governance policies and procedures are your own. The platform will help you respond to data requests. It will complement your governance, but it doesn't tell you how to do your governance. What our platform does require is metadata. So these are the descriptions of your governance and the descriptions of your data. It's not the data itself, it's not the sensitive stuff, that always stays with you. But to help researchers find you and your research, we need those descriptions and that metadata. And you can do that by contacting uh, your local node. Uh, so we have a network of nine nodes around Australia. And they're really the key operational units that connect trialists into the HDA platform. Just one more quick note, uh, you don't have to have ethics approval to be included in Health Data Australia. And if you have questions about any of the things I just described um, or about getting involved, please reach out to your local node who can guide you through these issues. So as I said before, as a secondary researcher, I can come to the platform, I can search 
that non-sensitive metadata and I can submit a request. As we saw before, the request is then sent to you, the trialist, and you review it against your specific requirements. If you determine that that request meets your requirements, you make arrangements directly with the researcher for them to access the data. So again, there's two key points that I really need to hammer home. The HDA platform holds only your metadata and you, the trialist, decide if a researcher can have access to the data and how they access it. So that's the platform that we've built in the Hassanda program. It was a massive collaborative effort and there are a lot of components that make it all work and a lot of complementary resources that have been developed over the last couple of years to help researchers to share their data. Uh, it would take another hour to highlight all of those things, so I'm not going to uh, speak about those. Today I'm going to focus on the breadth of perspectives that have contributed to Hisanda and helped build Health Data Australia. Adrian already discussed our advisory committee who have guided the program from its inception. But three years ago, we began public consultations to hear the perspectives, the priorities and the principles of the broader health research community. So this includes trialists, includes health consumers, includes so many people. And I'd like to thank those 200 plus individuals who gave us their time, <clears throat> shared their expertise and their lived experience and set the direction for the work that we've done. I also need to thank the editorial team that was drawn from that community as well as the AIHW and ACTA who partnered with us in running the consultations. So after speaking to the community about those requirements, their requirements, we then started co-designing a solution. And I say co-design because at this stage we had about 100 people uh, with relevant expertise contribute to a series of working groups. The majority of these people were drawn from what, I, what are now our nine Hassanda nodes. So this is a network of over 70 unis, MRIs, clinical trials networks, and other health research organisations. Seven of our nodes uh, provide regional coverage in most states and territories. The other two nodes have specialisations, one in cancer trials and one in mental health trials. Now, that's too many people and too many organisations to name check in speech. Um, but thank you, everyone. Um, and for people out there, please contact ARDC. We will put you in touch with your local Hassanta node. So after that large collaborative design effort, our node network then worked with us to build HDA and integrate their own systems and procedures. Now they've been working tirelessly to onboard existing clinical trials, but importantly, they've established the policies and procedures that will allow data sharing to become the new normal for clinical trials in Australia into the future. I also need to acknowledge a few other key development partners here. ANZCTR have worked with us throughout the process and we look forward to continuing work with them. The CTIQ, who developed a template to help trialists get participants' consent to share data, so please go and check out their informed project. Uh, and to ACTA, who continue to help guide our engagement with clinical trials networks and participants. I also need to thank some ARDC colleagues. These are our developers. Without their work, there'd be no HDA platform. They're gonna hate that their photos are on screen, but they should get some recognition for all the hard work that they do. Uh, thanks also to all these ARDC colleagues who um, contribute to Hassanda over the last three years. We have metadata experts, sensitive data and data governance specialists, and informatics systems and policy advisors all working a lot of the time behind the scenes. Finally, big thank you to my colleagues on the Hassanda team, Adrian for his patronage of Hassanda, Rhys Williams uh, for the wealth of experience that he brings working with the health research sector, and to Amanda Tompilado for the tireless enthusiasm that she brings to our technical development work. So, to the hundreds of people who are part of Hassanda and the 80 odd organisations who partnered with us, it's a privilege to lead such a significant collaboration. Thank you. Well done to everyone who contributes from around Australia. So now that I'm done, I promise I'm done, uh, we're going to hear from three people with different takes on Hassanda. So to begin with, I'd like to introduce Delane Smith. Delane is the CEO of the Australasian Leukemia and Lymphoma Group and the former chair of the Cancer Cooperative Trials Group. This group is comprised of the 14 Australian Cancer Trial Networks, and we're very lucky to have them as part of Hassanda. Thanks, Delane.
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Delane Smith. I'm the CEO of the ALLG. However, it's my very great pleasure to represent the 14 cancer cooperative trial groups uh, of Australia uh, that have been a part of this node. Uh, we have uh, really enjoyed the experience. We're looking forward to the ongoing collaboration. And uh, I'd like to thank Sahamri for hosting us today uh, for, for this forum. So I will just move forward. So I just thought I'd start with a couple of uh, slides that uh, well-known information to us all, but to help really set the scene as to why this actual project was so important to the 14 cancer cooperative trial groups in Australia. So uh, you all know that it's uh, absolutely critical to run clinical trials for the improvement and treatment and outcomes for patients. Uh, to provide physicians and patients with new treatments uh, and to improve medical knowledge. The government and industry in Australia invest a billion, over a billion dollars annually to clinical trials in Australia. We rank the middle globally for clinical trial activity per capita. We are well renowned internationally for the quality of our clinical trial outputs. Uh, most of the groups in the Cancer Cooperative Trial Group node are also New Zealand uh, groups as well, so we're Australian and New Zealand, so in, in actual fact New Zealand is a big part of what we do and a big contributor to our clinical trial programs. And there's some really key features here in Australia that make it a great place to do clinical trials. We have universal health care, Medicare for everybody, standard of care tests and treatments and procedures funded. We have a good solid public hospital uh, system in Australia that is supported by state government jurisdictions and government funding. We have a national drug regulatory progr program that has good methods and good assessments to get drugs to market in Australia through the TGA and the PBAC. We have a national program for lead ethics under the NMA, which means we can fast track ethics approvals faster than a lot of other countries that we get compared to in the world. We have uniformed site contracts that we can use to get sites operating quickly with the clinical trials that we want to run. And we have a national accreditation scheme that has recently been introduced for the benefit of our hospitals and our hospital clinical trial departments. So you can see here, we've got a good framework for running clinical trials in Australia for the design and the conduct of clinical trials. Having the same problem you had, Adrian. <laughs> Okay, so some other information, again, well known to everybody in this, in this room. This slide is a little bit out of date because ANZCTR have produced their data that goes up to 2020 now, but half a million people in Australia are participating in clinical trials. We know that there has been a big shift in commercial clinical trials to academic investigator initiated clinical trials being run in Australia over the last 10 and 15 years. There is a decrease in the average sample size, and this is not, uh, uh, I suppose, a surprise to anybody in the room, given the advancements we're making in cancer care particularly. So we are looking at more targeted therapies, our sample sizes are getting smaller, so our populations are getting more specific. So we actually need to run more trials to get the bigger effect, the bigger opportunity for patients to be getting access to treatments quicker. So I've set the scene here. You can see why in cancer, clinical trials, number one priority for Australia, and why making our research that we are conducting more valuable for the long term through a program like the project that we've just run with ARDC and the Hassanda team. So who are the nodes? We are 14 groups. Uh, we represent investigator-initiated trials. So we are all member-based organisations. Each group has at least a thousand members in the group of clinicians, researchers, scientists, biostatisticians, study coordinators, all the specialists that you can think of that are involved in the treatment and the care of people who have cancer in Australia. We all conduct multi-site, multi-state clinical trials. So that is a big underpinning thing across all 14 groups. We have a lot of similarities in the ways we are in the way we are governed through our membership arrangements, but also in the way we operate clinical trials. So we already as a cancer uh, network had very well established relationships. The youngest group out of the 14 of us is 10 years old, the oldest group is 50. So we've got a lot of experience We've clearly got hundreds of trials that we've conducted with great data sitting there that actually should have the opportunity to be reused for secondary data research projects. 
So why did we want to become involved? I think I've convinced you. I'm surely, hopefully my enthusiasm has convinced you as to why this is so important for all of us. But actually it was a no brainer from the very start for us. Individually, not one of our single cancer clinical trial groups could have sort of gone into this and tried to establish ourselves as a node. So it was a great opportunity for the network we already had as the 14 of us to come together and do this as a networked project. It seemed a terrific opportunity to continue the strength that we were already making in terms of valued data contributions and valuable clinical trials for Australians in Australia. The project was actually also at the early stages addressing things we were already, already starting to question uh, with ourselves, like, oh, how can we you know, make uh, more of the trials we've conducted after they've published more available, more impactful, available for other researchers? And we ourselves did not have a uniformed uh, way of doing this. So this was looking like a really good capacity building project to be involved with. And to be able to be involved from the very start was very attractive to us as well. Rather than having something that's placed there and said, there it is, we were actually allowed in this case to get involved actively with the project development. So the aims of the national data asset, you know, to increase the value of data collected in health studies. This was mutually agreeable to all of the nodes from the very start when we started talking about the opportunity. The aim that uh, ARDC has to improve capacity for data sharing and secondary use of data. Again, something very important to us and we see as something that will be very successful over the coming years. We saw that this will have a immediate impact on the past trials that we've conducted and it will have an impact on the current trials we are running and it will give sustainability to the future trials that we'll be running through our cancer cooperative trial groups. The infrastructure is absolutely needed and uh, a couple of our groups had already started to have contact through our membership networks from internationals that were starting similar projects and we were getting approached to say oh should we be putting our australian trials into international platforms similarly so it was great timing because like no we want to invest in our australian researchers it is so important to be able to invest back in australia to keep the specialties that we're developing here in australia so it's very attractive for us to um, get involved in this project. Despite the fact that we're all being great trialists uh, in our groups for so long, uh, there was actually a lot of things about the Hassander project that were new to us in terms of data and reusing data. So it was a good learning opportunity. It was a bit of a steep learning curve at the very start. But this concept of a federated model uh, that supports the coherent data practices, that standardises compliance, ethics, governance. It was very much uh, welcomed by us all. And with the funding that we received through being a successful node, uh, we were able to employ a project manager, uh, Martina Carezzo, who's here in the room, who you know, who's an absolute star, who's read, uh, led this whole project implementation for the cancer cooperative trial groups. So collaboratively uh, working with the node and with ARDC has helped deliver the aims of the project. And through this, we've been able to create local excitement in each of our groups. We've been able to get some education and teamwork going and then be able to uh, contribute it at the uh, natural, uh, at, at, at the group level. So what have we done? We appointed our project manager. We've joined and participated in various committees and working groups and the worker bees, uh, which has been a big part of the last couple of years. Uh, we've been able to actively participate in the design and the development activities, produce the SOPs, the guiding documents, you know, use the experience that we've had in all of our individual cancer groups over the years to actually put forward the best practice and the best way to get these forms and tools and templates going. We've been able to better support ANZCTR, which is so important for us to do as a nation. We've conducted training for researchers, improved awareness overall, and we strengthened just locally uh, our networking as our cancer cooperative trial groups. And did I say we've put forward 49 trials? So, sorry, did we, we put forward 49 trials. I just want to make it clear. Martina has done this work. We put forward 49 trials into the start of the project. So we're very proud of that and we thank the team uh, for their support in that. So going forward, uh, we are I'm absolutely looking forward to the continued work. Our members of each of our cancer trial groups are excited to be able to continue to see that this will be the value of the contribution our trials will continue to make. Uh, we will be introducing uh, more regular training into each of our cancer cooperative trial groups. And of course, now at the start of design of our trials, 
in all the groups, we all have this standard methodology for design that starts to plan for the end and the reuse of the data and data sharing capacity. And there's a couple of champions that we would like to thank in particular, uh, Kristen, Reese, and Adrian. You've just set an amazing tone, great culture. There are so many lovely people in this room and online, and I think it really comes down to the three of you. You've just been terrific. So sincerely from all of us, thank you very much, and to everyone else in the ARDC and Hassanda. Thank you. So in addition to the 49 trials that we contributed, I get to actually invite my friend Wendy. So Wendy Keach has led the Health Translation South Australia since 2018 and currently serves as the company's executive director. In this role, Wendy advocates to bring together the expertise and strengths of partner organisations to accelerate the rate of translation of evidence into healthcare to improve the health system and positively impact patient outcomes. Under Wendy's leadership, HTSA has grown to incorporate 11 partner agencies. That's fantastic, Wendy, well done, that's amazing. And continues to create and accelerate impact for the health system and its consumer base. And again, the consumer base, our patients, this is absolutely core to what we're all doing. Prior to her role at Health Translation South Australia, Wendy amassed a wealth of experience in the health and medical sector. During her 11-year tenure at the National Heart Foundation, she directed and led the state heart health programs while spearheading the national warning signs of heart attacks, heart attacks strategy. Do you think they designed that to really put people up when they do traction? <laughs> Fantastic, sorry. In her subsequent roles, Wendy played a key role in driving impactful research projects at the Walnda Paringa Aboriginal Research Unit within the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, Sahamri. Throughout her career, Wendy has demonstrated a strong aptitude for developing, implementing and evaluating evidence-based programs. Her broad range of expertise includes strategic planning, prevention, public health, heart disease, physical activity, tobacco control and nutrition, and just a fantastic person. So welcome up. Welcome up, Wendy, everybody. Crikey, that was a anyway. anyway, lovely to be here today, and it's actually great to have people in South Australia and um, and certainly online as well. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're meeting on Ghana land and pay my respects to elders, past, present, and future, and any um, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people in the room and online. Um, as uh, mentioned, I'm going to give a little bit of a talk around the way our node worked, and it's really different to Delaney. So it's great that we both can share our perspective. Um, the South Australian node, of, uh, as was mentioned, is under the umbrella of Health Translation SA, and we're an NHMRC accredited research translation centre. As you may know, there's 14 of those across Australia, and we come together in something called ARA, the Australian Health Research Alliance. You will have noticed it on the advisory committee. Um, the alliance actually, uh, um, we come together as a council once a month, but what happened at the start of this journey is that the ARDC team, particularly Adrian, came to the ARA council and actually presented Hassanda to us and made us think about how does that fit into the data vision that, have, that ARA has for Australia. And in fact, it fitted pretty darn well. So what happened was um, we, as uh, our translation centres, were invited to think about whether we wanted to be a node or not. And in fact, six of the R translation centres or the uh, research translation centres in Australia put their hand up to be a node. And us in South Australia, it just made sense. We already had our 11 partners across the state and it made sense that we could position ourselves to really think about this um, opportunity with clinical trials and um, the data that comes from it and how we could really um, extend its value. So um, as I mentioned, uh, there was uh, six research translation centres that applied. And so we now sort of have a network within the network, which is kind of cool. Um, so in uh, Health Translation SA, as we mentioned, has 11 partners and our board, um, and the chair of our board is here today, um, our board actually embraced Tassanda and realised the value that it had to all of South Australia. And since we started the journey some years ago, we've really uh, worked hard to reach across our partners. Particularly, there's been two partners that have been instrumental in going from um, 
a blank slate to something that's actually working in the state. At SAMRI, SAMRI here um, was able to uh, transform its systems and um, upload some clinical trials into the, uh, into the catalogue so that we were really able to um, bring SAMRI on this journey. Now, really, um, this is really important for, you, you, for everyone to understand that up until then, we weren't in this game. You know, it actually, obviously there were lots of clinical trials happening across the state, but to actually be thinking about what are the systems we need to share data is um, a different step. So having SAMRI come on board and the technical support here um, was really important for us to start to conceptualise what are the changes that need to happen in all of these different organisations. Um, Delaney was talking about what happens within one thing that's already established. What we had was six or eight different partner organisations, we had to go, okay, how do we bring them all on this journey? So we set up a steering committee that was reaching across those interested partners and also a technical reference group. Uh, Tamara Hooper's up the back there, who um, gives a wave, Tamara. She, uh, Tamara led a lot of this work for South Australia. And as a result of having that steering committee and technical reference group, we were able to start to increase the um, all, all the interactions with Hassanda. As I've already mentioned, uh, Hassanda, um, SAMRI were part of that initial uh, project. And then Flinders University, and I think there's some of the Flinders people online, if they're not here in the room, were able to also, oh, there we go, great. Um, were able to also work really hard with their systems to try and say, how do we Hassanderize our university? You know, And it's not without challenge. We actually had, is that, is that a word, Hassanderize? Um, it's not without challenge because we actually had to work with the, uh, you know, the different people on the steering committee and also on the technical group. But we then got to a ceiling where we went, we actually need major organisational support if we're going to have this um, in, uh, taken on board by, Sam, uh, by um, Flinders. So up the ladder, we went right to the top of the university and then had to come back down to get that level of support. So I don't think we really understood that we needed this culture change, we needed leadership, we needed management support, we needed technical support, we needed the clinical trials teams, of course, but we needed all this other stuff through the organisation to be on board for this to actually start to work. And as a result of that, and thanks to the Flinders crew that are here and online, we did get some trials um, put into the catalogue and we got over the line. But I wanted to just let you know that it, it, it's actually a culture change process and it's an education process and it's actually bringing all these people on the journey and without the actual platform to demonstrate it. So now that we've got the platform that we can demonstrate, the value proposition is much clearer. But leading up to this day, we've been doing this with kind of like, it's going to be really good. You're all going to really you know, be benefit from this, but what is it? So that's been a journey we've been on. We're now really well positioned because our other partners have been um, on those steering committees, on those technical reference groups, and they are now positioned to step into the space. And that's the work that we have ahead of us in the next six months. Um, and thank goodness that we actually have uh, staff capacity to actually help do that. Because without that coordinating capacity, these projects are really hard to deliver on, but we've really uh, been happy to do it. So it's um, important to recognise that each of the partner organisations are different, different and their pathway to being involved is different and that the coordinating role is critical. Um, we need to be really clear of the benefits uh, to all parties, the technical requirements and the level of cultural change that is needed. And that's whether you're the clinical trialist, the library staff or the tech staff. So I wanted to thank all those who've been supporters um, and some are here in the audience and some are online. So all of those people that have been part of this journey, it's been fabulous. I also wanted to thank Reese um, and Kristen, who've been terrific in, in bringing everything together and always on the end of the phone to have a chat. It's been a great project. We still have a ways to go, hand on heart. We still have a ways to go, but we're on the journey and, and we're really looking forward to what it can make for South Australia. But importantly, it's how we collaborate with the other nodes, which has really got us to a place we would never have been otherwise. Um, the discussions that they have, uh, the, the um, operational staff having all the time about how we advance this. So our job um, will be made much easier as we now that we can clearly d demonstrate the value and the benefits that are going to be able to be reached. And uh, we look forward to this. So thanks to the Hassanda team. Uh, thanks to all the other nodes. 
uh, for your effort, the processes we've put in place, the collaboration and also the camaraderie, uh, because that sharing has really been something that um, I don't think we expected when we first put that application in three years ago. So finally, congratulations to you guys and congratulations to all of us. Um, we're really happy to be on this journey, uh, but we're on a journey. Thank you. Now, I think my job is to, yes, I was, should have said the same about mine, Julian, um, to, re, to reduce Julian's bio, but uh, to introduce um, Professor Julian Elliott. Uh, Julian is the Director and Founding Chair of the Australian Living Evidence Consortium and Founding Director of the Australian National COVID-19 Clinical Evidence Task Force, which are both, are both based at the Cochrane Australia within Monash University of Public Health and Preventative Medicine, uh, where he is also the Professor in Evidence Synthesis. Is that enough? All right. Come on up, Julian. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to Adrian and Kristen and everyone else for inviting me to speak. Um, I've been involved for a few years in this journey, and I must say, as everyone else has mentioned, it's been a fantastic journey to get to the starting line. Um, it's a great team. And uh, look, my first reflection would just be that I think in, you know, in, the, in trying to change scientific ecosystems, there's always this interplay between uh, infrastructure, culture, and policy. And I think Cassandra up to this point has just done a great job at kind of moving each of those forward. They all, they're, they're always in interplay and you, you, you always need to be moving one forward and then the other's kind of catching up slightly. But that kind of triangulation between those kind of three kind of pillars of work to really change the way that the research ecosystem works in, in health and around health data in Australia, I think has just, again, been magnificent effort over the last few years. And I think importantly, you can feel the energy from different people across the country. And that's that's the thing I think it, it's, it can't of course be sitting in one organization. It can't be just a, a small limited number of individuals. This really has to be a whole kind of movement, a whole journey from across uh, health, res uh, health research across Australia. And I think again, you've, um, I think ARDC and working with the nodes and others have really set up the conditions extremely well for that to be a you know, really solid, solid foundation going forward. So my job's to talk a little bit about the why, like you've heard about all the work, incredible effort over the last few years. So why do we do this? What's, what's, the, what's, what are we trying to achieve? Um, to me, I think just to kind of step up a level, you know, when you think about it, I think it really goes to the nature of science. You know, essentially what we're saying here is that, you know, science is, a, is an empirical undertaking. Science is about generating, is running experiments and generating data and then making assertions based on that data. And essentially what we're saying here is that the researcher themselves has particular ideas, hypotheses that they're investigating through those, those trials, through those experiments, but others may have other ideas. That, that there, is, there, is, there is interesting perspectives, there's interesting uses of the data generated through any experiment that, that might be um, driven by or, or discovered, uncovered by others across the world. And I think that is, I'll, that is how science works. And so by making the outputs of research studies more widely available, we're just unlocking that potential to a much, much kind of broader um, community of, of researchers. And so when we think about the use, I would say in general, we can't predict the limit to the use of those data. It, there, there is no limit to the imagination of others and the, and the uses that they might put those data together. And so by, you know, as a, as a kind of fundamental principle in making these data available, we're really unleashing that potential. So that of course is extremely exciting. Very specifically, the work we do at Cochrane Australia and many of our partners working on evidence synthesis and guideline development, you know, what we're about is really trying to understand a body of research and then use that to shape practice and policy. And we try to bring the most rigorous um, approaches possible to that. We're essentially custodians of research outputs. We want to take very good care of that research output and ensure that it is, you know, we're creating very high fidelity, high quality signals that are then being fed into our healthcare system and into policy making. So to do that, what do we do currently? Pre predominantly, we work off a PDF document. <laughs> we have <coughs> research articles that we, of course, um, search for, discover, 
extract the data from, appraise the quality, et cetera, to create our kind of assets as part of that value chain into improving healthcare. Of course, that is not an incredibly rich source of data. It's unstructured, it's summary data. It's of course incredibly valuable, but we could do a lot more if we had more. So um, of while that whole world that we work in, evidence synthesis guideline development, I think will predominantly use that kind of summary data out of research articles for some time to come. You know, there is a shift happening globally towards greater availability of primary research data. And of course that provides enormous um, value for us. There's many things that we can't do with the limited summary data we have in a research article that we can do if somebody through a consortium or any other sort of research endeavor has access to that underlying primary data and then enables the combination of that data to essentially um, discover new insights. So it could be that just through various kind of human um, processes, the way that trials have been reported in, um, in different articles just doesn't line up. And that creates a lot of difficulty for us. So if we get access to the underlying data, it means we can combine the data much more readily. Or it could be that we increase the power such that we can get much, much clearer idea about subgroup effects, which is truly a kind of step towards personalized medicine, you know, beyond the hype, <laughs> actual step towards personalized medicine, being able to combine the data to look at those subgroup effects. So it's incredibly powerful um, and very interesting for us. Um, and I think our community will be, you know, very well engaged in the, in the kind of infrastructure and, and the, the um, data that you're making available. Second point I wanted to make was just that this is a global movement. Um, there are similar sort of repositories that have been established around the world. And so I think for Australia not to do this would be um, an incredible mistake. I mean, we would essentially just miss the train. This is, this is the way that, that not only health research, but research in general is moving. Um, you know, there's been a lot of movement in this in the US and the EU and, and beyond. And, uh, you know, for us to not take this opportunity and really move ahead, I think would just put us further and further behind. And of course, in saying that, it's not just the, the, the infrastructure, it's everything else that we've been talking about. It's the community, it's the policy change, it's ethics and consent forms, and it's essentially then shifting that culture. So that takes a long time. So it's, in, it's in really important that we, that we start this journey now and really you know, take the Australian research community on that journey. So I think we've got a lot to contribute, both here in Australia through this work, but then also just a note that this will contribute to a kind of global movement as well. And the increasingly the ability of researchers to tap into data from different uh, repositories around the world. Um, and so the final point I would make really is just from my previous life, running a clinical trials unit, and running many clinical trials, is I think, you know, a number of people have touched on this today. It's really that ultimately those data have been generated by people of, in the Australian public who've put themselves at risk through the participation in clinical trials. And again, I've consented hundreds of patients. I know, you know, when you're sitting down talking to someone about the entry into a clinical trial, it is about risk. There are, of course, many potential benefits, but those benefits often are unknown. And so it's about um, also that, that understanding that entering that clinical trial, I am taking risks. And so in doing that, if we're asking the Australian public to do that in order to kind of power our research endeavors, then it's incumbent upon us to really make the, the most value um, out of that contribution. So I think ultimately that's, that's another important aspect of really what Hassandra is about. It's saying that we really value those contributions. We understand not only the risk, but also the time and effort and um, other disruptions that cl clinical trial participation incurs. And we value that and we really honor that. And so therefore we will make possible the most um, uh, the largest possible um, benefit from that participation so thank you all um, again I think it's been in a ma magnificent ever over the last few years and as a number of people have said this is only just the start but I think very exciting start for this program thank you Okay, so 
Thank you to all our speakers. Um, as we close out the event, where are we going from here? So over the coming months and over the coming years, as Adrian said, uh, we're going to be doing, ARDC is going to be doing a lot more investment and a lot more work in the health research sector. So there'll be ongoing enhancements to Health Data Australia. Um, great to hear after three and a half years work, people saying this is just the start. Doesn't necessarily feel like that to me. Um, but we will be uh, continuing, continuing to improve the platform. We'll be looking to integrate new technologies. For example, uh, how do we integrate secure access platforms so that once you've given, uh, been given access to data that you have a secure place to work on that data. Um, we're gonna be looking for opportunities to grow the Hassanda network. Um, and we're gonna be expanding beyond uh, clinical trials into other research areas. Actually, that starts next week. Um, so if you haven't already, uh, you're involved in cohort studies or clinical registries, uh, we start consultations on that next week to begin again. Um, and we'll be doing a whole lot of outreach and training. So that brings us to the end of today's event. If you'd like to learn more or get involved, please contact ARDC. Uh, as we like to say, click like and subscribe. Um, if you'd like to start contributing to Health Data Australia, we can put you in touch with our node network. Uh, and before we go, special thank you to our ARDC Commons team for supporting this event. Very special thank you to our speakers and a very, very special thank you to Tamara Hooper, who's hiding up the back, who put all the hard work into pulling this launch together. Thank you everyone for joining us today.